and uh, you guys weren't there, so none of you, not even, they weren't even there, so you wouldn't recognize any of it. Uh, but anyway, that's, uh, I preached it in Clarendon one time, and the title of the sermon is, Who Are You? A husband and a wife were driving through Louisiana. As they approached Nacogdoches, they started arguing about the pronunciation of the town. Because it doesn't sound like that. It doesn't look like that. And they argued back and forth. Then they stopped for lunch at the counter. The husband asked the waitress, before, you, before we order, could you please settle an argument for us? Would you please pronounce where we are very slowly. So she leaned over and said, Burger King. <laughs> when I was growing up as a kid in uh, Tron, her dad was four years younger than me. We have a sister in between us. She's been, you know Julene, she's been here I think one time. One time. But I didn't get much respect when I was a kid growing up, my brother tried to kill me. He threw a knife at me, and then it stuck right in between my teeth. I saw it come, and I grimaced. It st there was blood. My dad smashed the knife. It was my brother. My parents, you know, when I was born, they, they named me Lauren, but they knew I wouldn't like it, so they didn't nickname me Woody on the same day. There's no respect. <laughs> They took him, Tron, and bought him a guitar. I got a kazoo. It was no respect. Our sister grew taller than us. We're the boys. We're supposed to be taller. She's still doing it. She's still taller than both of us. No respect at all. And I officiated. They had three weddings. They had three kids all got married in the same year. You may you try that sometime. <laughs> But the one wedding I officiated, I saw him, looked at my brother, and he looked better in his black suit than I did. And I'm the officiant. I'm supposed to look the best. His shoes were shinier. So I had to go buy a new suit because I had another wedding to do up there. If you had any more kids <laughs> getting married in the same. And I get a new pair of shiny shoes, so I look better than my brother. And I'm the officiant. He's always handsome or smarter. He's always, he, seriously, my brother. I called him on a phone one day. And I said, thanks for being my brother. He said, I didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> Joking aside, I dearly love my brother. There's nobody else like, there's nobody else like him. He's one of a kind. Amazing. But I don't get favoritism from God. He's no respecter of persons. We don't deserve respect. We might think we deserve respect from each other. But we don't deserve any respect from God because he's not a respecter of persons. So I don't deserve respect, favoritism, or anything else from God. Grace is unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor of God. And I don't deserve it, but I get it anyway. So, the question is, who do you think I am? Who are you? In Psalm 2, 7, it says, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. That's a clue to who I am and who you are. In Exodus chapter 3, 13, it starts in 13. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What's his name? Then what shall I tell them? So Moses was asking God, Who are you? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I say I am. And in the Hebrew, that's Yahweh. It comes down to us as Jehovah. This is what you're saying to the Israelites. I am sent me to you. Uh, and in verse 15, God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, He has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. God's answer was, I am. 
I am. Yahweh refers to himself as undefinable. If you define something by name, then you limit it to what that name is. If I, if I hold up a bottle of water, it's not a hammer. It's a bottle of water, because that's what I'm calling it. So if I say that to you, I have a bottle of water, what do you picture in your mind? Not a hammer, not a saw, not a shotgun. You picture a bottle of water. Well, you can't do that with God, because you can't limit him to a name. I am what I am, Yahweh. So we think of God in many ways. Creator, Savior, source of life, judge, soon coming king. There are seven names that, I, that I'm thinking of. Yahweh Yaira, the Lord will provide. Yahweh Rapha, the Lord that healeth. Yahweh Nisi, the Lord our banner. Yahweh Shalom, the Lord of our, the Lord our peace. Yahweh Ra'a, the Lord my shepherd. But who are you? And who am I? Just who do you think you are? Did you, you ever say it to somebody? Just who do you think you are anyway? Did you ever say that to somebody? I, uh, if I ask a Native American person living along the Delaware River 400 years ago, they would say, I am Lenny Lenape. That describes their culture. Literally, that means I'm a, a real person. If I ask the same question uh, about the name of a Native American tribe in central New York State, the answer would be Hadinosane. We That comes down to us as Iroquois, or the people of the Longhouse. And the people living up around them were Senecas. They were the keepers of the Western Gate. But they still call themselves Hadinosane. They still do, the, the Iroquois people. Iroquois, I think, might be a French name. But they didn't call themselves that unless they allowed the French people to, to influence them in that way. But defining them as one of the Five Nations Confederacy that, that we know as Iroquois. And that name tells you something about how they lived in their culture. And later it became Six Nations with the addition of the Tuscan. Auroras, and, but it's still that name, Iroquois or Harinosane, that describes how we should consider themselves uh, of the, about their culture. But somebody asks me, who are you? What does he want to know in a word or a phrase? How he should consider me or how he should relate to me. If, I, if he asks me who I am and I say Woody, well that's just a nickname. If I say Pastor Woody, that adds something to his understanding. We can define ourselves in a word or in a phrase. We can say, I am thus and such, indicating how they should think of us. If I say I'm a butcher or a meat cutter, like Clyde spent his whole life as a meat cutter, you would probably not bring your sick pet to me for treatment because that word describes something that you're not going to take your sick pet to. Athena is a dog groomer. She has a business of dog grooming. And Rick is a talented blacksmith. He's an artistic blacksmith. He makes beautiful, amazing architectural blacksmith Amazing things, amazing. My father's sign said, Woods Funeral Home. Nobody came to him for dental work. So a name describes you, but you can't describe God by a name because it limits the description to that name. That's why he said, I am, I am. I exist. Some of the names that we used to be sure of, like man or woman, we used to be sure, man, woman. And now they're in question because of social engineering run amok. This trans business is total nonsense. There's no, there's no clinical way to, to, it's just how you feel. And it changes. 
So Genesis 127, so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God. He created them male and female. He created them. The trans stuff is crazy. Genesis 5, first two verses. This is ri the written account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and he named them mankind when they were created. So now I can say that I am a man. That is, I am one of mankind and that I am created in the image of God. There are things that Scripture says that I am. You know, what Scripture calls me and calls you is what we are. So ask me, who are you? Who are you? I am a sinner saved by grace. Amen. Ask me. Who are you? I'm a child of the King. Galatians 3.26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. 2 Corinthians 6.18. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Ask me, who are, who are you? Who are you? I'm a friend of Jesus. And these all apply to you, too, not just me. John 15.15. 15, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that you learn that I learned from my father I have made known to you ask me again I am the, one of the redeemed Ephesians 1 7 in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according but with the richness of God's grace I'm redeemed I'm set free from the law of sin and death that's who I am ask me one more time <laughs> thank you for putting up with me doing that I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit first Corinthians 6 19 and 20 do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have received from God you are not your own you were bought at a price the price was paid on Calvary by the way therefore honor God with your bodies the temple, the first structure in which God manifested his presence was the tabernacle of Moses in Exodus. He manifests his presence in that structure. That doesn't mean he was limited. You can't contain God. The first temple was built by Solomon. David had a plan and had the materials, but God would not allow him to build that because he was a warrior and had shed much blood. Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar. The second temple came during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. There were four edicts to build the second temple issued by three kings, Cyrus, Darius and Artaxerxes. So that was the second, and it was, a, it was a rebuild. And then there was Herod's temple around 20 BC. Herod the Great expanded and renovated the temple. But his temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans, as you know. At different times, the temple was treated with contempt. Idol worship took place in the temple of our God under Solomon. The temple was man-made. The temple was destroyed. The temple was rebuilt. The temple was destroyed again. Destroyed again. The temple is no more. The temple doesn't exist at the present time. There's a few remnants of it. God allowed a temple to be built for his name, 1 Kings Chapter 8, when the priest withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. And the priest could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. When Solomon dedicated the temple, God honored Israel with his presence in the temple. The temple couldn't contain God, but he manifested his presence there in that temple. Now, 
God in the form of the Holy Spirit comes into believers at the moment of salvation. We are the temple. The ancient temple was the place where sacrifices took place. Those people had to relate to God through the priesthood. Jesus fulfilled the need for a priesthood. And we don't have to relate to God through priests and through sacrifices anymore. Jesus fulfilled that need on Calvary. The animal sacrifices were only a shadow of the true sacrifice of Jesus himself that would come. When Jesus gave up his life, the temple curtain was torn in two. Now and forever, we don't have to go through a priest or an animal sacrifice to approach God. We don't have to bring blood. Jesus' blood paid the price once and for all. Amen. Hebrews 4, 14 and 16 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Verse 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We've all had times of need, times when we're hurting. The worst need you can ever have is when you're outside of salvation. When you're outside and you don't know it. But God is there, arms out, ready to receive us. God chose to abide in regenerated, born-again believers. So who am I? I am the abiding place, the temple of God's Holy Spirit. I need to be sure not to defile God's temple. 2 Timothy 1.14, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So, who am I? What do you see? An old fat guy with white hair and chin whiskers. What can you tell by what you see? You know, I had a job interview. It was a, I was living in... Plainville, Connecticut, and there was a, a, a job opening for a photographer, experienced studio photographer in Peoria, Illinois. A friend of mine had gone out there and recommended me. So I went out there for this interview, and I was carrying my Bible. And when I came off the plane, the guy that owned the studio and his partner, they were standing there, and he told me later, he said, when I saw you carrying that Bible, I knew you were the man for me. What can you tell by what you see? I remember we had a dedication of the, of the, we built an addition on the home church down there in Altoona. It was like a tent. And uh, by the way, Wednesday's our senior meeting down there. Um, and Philip Bongiorno, who was the district superintendent at the time, they named the convention center after him. He came up to me and he said, who might you be? Because I was all dressed up in a black suit. He thought I was something special, some kind of a dignitary or, you know, who might you be? I said, I'm just one of the deacons around here. So what you see tells you something. He didn't really want to know my name. He just wanted to know, you know, more, more what I was than who I was. The most important answers to the question of who am I is a question of who am I in God. Amen. That is who I am. Who I am in God, that's who I am. 
because I'm redeemed. Therefore, I must be more careful than the ancient Israelites. They allowed the temple to be defiled. We have to clean out, restore the temple from time to time. We do. I need to guard what comes into my spirit through my eyes or through my ears, through my senses, through the internet, for, through Facebook and all those other social things. We have to guard what comes into our heart through those things. We have to be careful. I need to guard what comes into my spirit. Be careful what comes in there through the internet. Be careful what comes in there through... Just be careful what comes into your spirit. You are the temple. It's not to be defiled. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Amen. What about your temple? Second Kings, we read about King Josiah and Jehoiada. Jehoiada was the high priest. And they tore down, first they tore down the altars of Baal that were in the temple. They set to work rebuilding the temple of God, which was in disrepair from neglect. So they tore down Baal's altars from all around the area there. And how they worshiped Baal, if you don't already know this, was by burning their infants alive. That's how they did that. It's very easy to neglect the temple that you are. We have a lot of distractions. Got to go fishing, sports games. Today's Super Bowl Sunday, I guess. I don't watch it. When the Steelers are done, I'm done. I don't even know who's playing. But it's a big party. I've been in the store a couple of times this week. And, and um, people are just loading up their carts with soda and chips. And it's going to be a big party thing today. I suppose if I was going past a liquor store, I'd see people loading up their trunks full of that stuff too. So those things that distract you, they're not wrong in themselves. Family things and going fishing and not wrong in themselves. But when they take the place that's reserved in our hearts for God, when they become first, then that's trouble. For only God can be on the pedestal of your heart. Yeah. Trouble's going to set in if something else is on that pedestal. That's reserved for God. The enemy never stops trying to destroy the work of God in you and what God wants to do through you. Never stops. He never rests, never gets tired, never sleeps. He's always trying something new. If something doesn't work on you, he'll try to figure something else out. You got to be careful. You got to be watchful. You got to be realizing what he's trying to do to you. But our God doesn't rest either. He doesn't get weary. He never stops loving you. Amen. God has to occupy his rightful place on the pedestal of your heart. Yeah. The highest plane of your existence belongs to God exclusively. Amen. So in order to stay in that attitude, we have to have a prayer life, a scripture life. And we have to always be thinking about God. Everything that happens, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that. Yes. Praise God. Yes. Hallelujah. I was able to put my feet on the floor and get out of the bed. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Athena has some grandchildren. Those two little babies, that was a miracle. Thank you, Jesus, for those two little babies. They're doing real well. They're a year old. They're crawling around, running around the house, doing stuff. But that was a dangerous thing she was in, preeclampsia. I'd never heard of that before that happened. We put pictures up on the screen. We're praying for them. But you do 
get distracted and but the best way is to focus on God and thank him for everything that comes along if it's a negative thing that comes along thank God because he's going to fix it Amen. thank God no matter what praise God anyway yes. praise him anyway yes. let the praises come from your heart to God and don't forget to do that that's we have to keep that in our minds we have to keep God in the center of our thoughts and our activities and try to and, and try to open our spirit to God speaking to us about things he wants us to do he, he builds the kingdom one soul at a time one soul at a time it's amazing how God works just amazing you heard a couple of testimonies this morning well, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to pray a concluding prayer. And then I'm going to ask the voting membership of the church to come forward. We'll have a brief meeting. We don't have a, a lot of things to, uh, to do or discuss. I can smell the shells down there. I can smell them. Can you smell them? I can smell them. <laughs> smells good, huh? So, anyway, dear Lord, we thank you this morning that we have been able to join our hearts together to worship you and praise you today. We thank you for these words. We pray the words will, will rest on fertile ground, Lord, and then will cause them to have the effect that you want them to have. And we just ask you just for your blessing.